Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. We want to help you walk with God, grow in community, and live on mission. We exist to bring the good news of Jesus into all of life and all the earth. My name is Chris Kipp, and I serve as the lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And I hope this resource encourages you and helps you grow in a relationship with Christ. Here is this week's teaching. Again, welcome today. So glad that you are here. We're in a series uh, called Fount of Freedom, being salt and light in a political season. Oh my goodness. So we're talking about politics and what could go wrong, right? What could go wrong talking about politics at church? And I know uh, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is touchy and particularly this morning is a little bit touchy. Um, But I'm trying to make a case through this series that the outworking of Christian thought, of Christian theology, uh, that actually is good for everybody. And that includes people who are not Christians, okay? And we talked about that last Sunday as we looked at some people who have acknowledged that. Um, I, I was thinking this week that it might be good for us to have like a big sticky note that we put on our Bibles And and if we we wrote on that Bible, how stuff actually works, because, and and it's not like uh, you you should go and, you know, thump people on the head with your Bible and be like, don't you know, this is how stuff actually, no, no, like it's for us, because I think we're the ones that need to be convinced that this is actually how life is intended to, to operate and to work. And so we're talking about how does the word of God actually form how we uh, engage ourselves with the uh, the system of politics that we live in here as Americans. And we are so grateful for this nation. We're so grateful for the freedoms that we have, that we could come into a public school like this and hold a worship service. And we could talk about Jesus and preach the Bible in this room in our country. Like what a blessing it is that we have here in our nation, and so today uh, we're, we're diving in further, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking about something that is touchy. It's touchy. Uh, it's it's a difficult subject. It is uh, absolutely at the center of our political dialogue in our nation right now. Um, it elicits strong emotions and strong opinions and strong. Feelings, and it doesn't matter which side of the aisle that you're voting on. Like this is one that absolutely stirs people in in our nation. It, it can bring out our passion and our convictions, and it can also bring out pain and shame and condemnation. And so, if if, if you're here this morning, it's your first time here. I just want to ask you this: if you would just hang with me to the end, because I think what we're going to see at the end is the goodness of Jesus. What we just sing about together, we're, we're going to see that in God's Word, and it's and it's so good for us. So um, this morning, I want to talk about human dignity and the divide on abortion. That's, that's the subject, human dignity and the divide on abortion. We're going to be in Psalm 139. So if you have a, a, a copy of the scripture, you want to go there to Psalm chapter 139, go there with me. Uh, before we talk about that, I just want to make a confession to you. Um, I've never been pregnant before. Yeah, never happened um, in all these years. Not once have I actually been pregnant um, my wife and I have this running joke together uh, because we're both very competitive people. I don't know if you have, you know, uh, if you're married and, and you're both competitive. We learned early on that board games were not good for our marriage, so we don't do that anymore. Um, we just, you know, leave, leave that aside. And so, in our competitive nature, um, I will, you know, I will explain a painful experience to my wife that I've had. And at the end of it, I will say, it was worse than having a kid, worse than having a baby. To which she says, uh, you know, I've had three babies, and I I will guarantee you that that is not worse than having a baby, to which I say, I was there all three times, and it wasn't that bad, right? (laughs) So pray for Chris. Pray for Casey, actually. Um, because of my sense of humor is not uh, 
not always awesome. So I, I, I know this is a touchy subject. We're talking about life. We're talking about the unborn. Um, statistically, 2.7 million women will face an unexpected pregnancy this year in our nation. 2.7 million women will face an unexpected pregnancy. And what will happen when that, when, when, when that happens to them, they're going to feel probably a whole mix of emotions Uh, One of those emotions will be a sense of panic. It might be a sense of fear. It it might be a sense of shame. Um, They're probably going to begin to play out scenarios in their minds of what would happen if they actually have this child. And they're going to think, uh, how, could I, how, how could I bring a child into this situation? They're, they're, they're going to think, uh, I, I just got accepted into college. Or how could I do this to my, my parents or my mom or my dad? Or how could I bring shame on my family? And, and they're, they're going to begin to play out all those scenarios and this morning, what I want to do is try to uh, talk about what does the word say, and then look at what is our part as people who are not just concerned with politics, but who are concerned about people. Because the Lord Jesus came to, to rescue people. He came to die for people. He, he came to save people. People And so what I don't want you to think I'm doing this morning is just, you know, waving my Bible around and saying, you know, this is it. And, and if you've ever struggled with that, shame on you, because that's not what I'm saying this morning. Okay, so if that's a part of your story, please hear me. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. However, we need to talk about this because it is something that is, it's, it's in the middle of the debates that are happening right now. Um, Out of those 2.7 million women, 620 to 930, depending on which research you're looking at, will choose, 930,000, I'm sorry, will choose to have an abortion. So what does it look like for us to be not religious people, but Jesus people when it comes to the issue of of, of unexpected pregnancies and abortion? What does God's word teach us about this? And how does that shape how we engage in this political process? So Psalm 139, it's a Psalm of David. David, by the way, had his own issue of sexual sin. So if you know his story, he's not a, uh, a polished uh, priest in some sort of monastery kind of a person. This was a real guy who had real struggles, and those are chronicled for us in our scriptures And David is uh, writing this song, or this psalm, and it's the most beautiful biblical theology of human dignity. And I just want to kind of look at this together. So starting in verse 1, here's what he says. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest, you are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You've encircled me. You've placed your hand upon me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. Let's pause there. So he, he, he begins with this incredible portion talking about God's care for him, like that God would think about him, that, that God would see him, that God would perceive his thoughts from far away, that God would know when he, when he stood up or when he sat down or when he went to sleep and all the things that he's, he's, he's kind of expounding on here. And it, it hits on this word dignity. And that, that word means the quality or state of being worthy honored, or esteemed. It's the quality or state of being worthy, honored, or esteemed. And so when we talk about human dignity, the question is, why is a human worthy of dignity? Why why are they worthy of respect? Why are they worthy of being honored and esteemed? And what, what he marvels at is this wondrous knowledge. 
That's what he calls it, wondrous knowledge that God cares for him individually. Now, I know I, I've, I've said this before, but this always blows my mind that there are like 7.7 billion people on the planet right now, and God knows every single thing about me in you. Like the, the infinite knowledge and, and understanding of God just blows my mind. And so what this tells us is that human dignity is divinely established because we know that you're worthy of respect. You're worthy to be honored and esteemed because God concerns himself with you. And I'll just tell you this, there is no other philosophical view of human life that communicates dignity like that, period. The reason that we have a bill of rights in our nation is because people have been formed by this understanding that human beings have dignity and worth and value, and that is not because of, you know, any other reason except they are created by a God who is concerned about them. And so God has a very individual concern. When he says, I love you, it is, it is plural, but it's singular. Okay? He loves us in that way. It tells us that you're not a cosmic accident. You're, you're not the sort of evolutionary outcome of just sort of like a big bang and then eventually you turned into this form. It, it means that you're not a, a clump of cells, but you are the concern of the Father. You're the concern of God. And Jesus didn't come to die for you because you're trash. Right? He came to die for you because he loves you and he holds you as valuable. Holds you as valuable. So important. Now, here's how I want to connect this to the political conversation. When you look up classic liberalism, it was a concern with individual rights. It actually flows out of this right here in, in understanding that human beings were worthy of value and respect. And so a, a classic liberal wanted to limit the government from interfering with an individual right. They, they, they want to keep the government from overstepping into an individual person, okay? So it's a, it's a concern for people, a concern for individuals and it flows right out of Christian teaching, okay? Some of you are already like, oh, Chris, what are you saying to me right now? Well, let's hang in there a little bit longer. Verse seven, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Let's pause again right there. So he, he shifts now into this, this song of the inescapable presence of God, that no matter where he would go, God would be there, which is comforting when you're going through a hard time. Amen? If you've ever walked the valley of the shadow of death and you have that feeling like, God, where are you? The answer is he's right there. Amen. He's right there with you. And that's comforting to us. That we know there's no place that we could go anywhere. I mean, we could get on a rocket ship with Elon Musk and go to some, you know, Mars, whatever, and, and set up a colony. And guess what? God will be there too. Okay? Inescapable presence of God. And it's comforting. However, there's a little bit of what I, I feel like it's a little bit distressing for David as well. And here's why I say that. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me. Have you ever wanted to hide yourself? 
You want to hide yourself from God? Like you, you have this awareness of, of unworthiness or, or you, that shame, the condemnation that, that happens to us, right? That we feel because of our choices. And, and, and we have that feeling. It's like, I just want to hide myself from you. And he's like, that will never work because you're there. Even the dark is as light to you. I, I was thinking of, I, I found this online. It's, it's, uh, it's something that you kind of put around your door and it's Jesus saying, I saw that. Now, parents, I think this would be really good as we try to hold our kids accountable, put it in all of their rooms. I saw that. You, you, you can hide it from mom and dad, but you can't hide it from Jesus, right? I saw that. God is omni. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent, right? He's, he's everywhere, and he knows everything, and he has all power. He is the omni. And here's what that speaks to. The, the first one was dignity, but the second one is this. It's accountability. It, it, it's that you and I are individually accountable to God because he sees everything about us. And so when it talks about standing before him and giving an account for our lives, what we've done in the body, whether good or evil, we know that his accounting will be perfect. And he knows everything about us. We are all accountable before God. And to be accountable means this, that you actually have agency. You have will. You have choice. And your choices, your will, your agency, it matters. And God is watching everything about us. And we cannot hide from him. You can successfully hide things from everyone on the planet. But you will never successfully hide anything from God. Here's why I think that's important. Because when we talk about the first one, you know that God loves us and he sees everything about us. If you've ever gone through something painful and you've lost someone that you loved or you've had a tragedy take place and you read a verse like that, there's something in you says, okay, wait, wait, wait. If you know everything about me, and if you see everything, God, and if you know when I lay down, when I get up, how in the world could you let that happen? For many people, their struggle with the faith is that. How can a good and loving God let fill in the blank happen? How could he, have, how could he let that happen to me or to us? And what I think is so important is that the second portion of accountability, it helps round out our theology a little bit. Because what we see is that there's other things at play in the world. There's human sin and all the consequences that we experience because of that. We can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and look at what happened there and how that fractals out and touches our lives and breaks us apart. We, we see also that Satan and the world are at play, and, and all of those things fit under this understanding of accountability. It also protects us from a humanism that's like, you know, it's all about me, Jesus. You see when I lay down, you know when I get up in the morning, you're there to serve me my breakfast tacos when I wake up, right? You know, no, 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 that's not, not quite what it's saying, Right? It's not that we're the center of the universe. It's that we are loved by the one who is the center of the universe. And that makes all the difference in the world. The first one, we looked at classic liberalism, but classic conservatism is all about upholding a, a moral law. You know, about 100 years ago, they added this little phrase to the Pledge of, of Allegiance, and it's one nation under God, right? Under God. It's to uphold moral law. It's, it limits government overreach into the moral, societal, and institutional order of things. And so this second part would be like, like more like a conservative understanding of the world. So it's dignity and it's accountability. It's rights and it's responsibilities, and these are hand in hand. But this third section is where I want to kind of focus on this morning. Verse 13, read it with me. For it was you 
who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Wow. So if the first one was dignity, and the second section is accountability, this one speaks to sanctity. Sanctity. That word simply means what is sacred. And it tells us that life is divinely established. What is so interesting is he says, it was you who created my inward parts. And what he does is he takes the understanding of God as the creator, as you know, the one who makes you know, man and woman, Adam and Eve, in the garden. But it's like he doesn't just make them and say, well, let's just see where this goes from here. But it tells us that God was actually involved in the creation of you and me and every single human being that has ever been conceived in the world. He's the creator who's still creating. He's active in the creation of every person. And, and it shows us three, and you could argue for four stages of human life. The first one is this. It's prenatal. When I was formless, he said. When I, I was formless. In Ephesians 1.4, Paul tells us that he, the Father, chose us in him, in Jesus, before the foundation of the world, what? To be holy and blameless in love before him. You have a destiny from God that was before you were you. And it's like eternally, it was the destiny that God had for you. It's prenatal. Actually, I should say it this way. It's pre-prenatal. <laughs> before you were conceived, God had a destiny for you. He knew you. The second thing, it's prenatal. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So it's, it's a picture of God is at work inside of, 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 of a, a, a mama's tummy forming this child. And the third is postnatal. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them came to be. So God has this understanding of our entire lives. He can see the whole stage. And every single stage is marked with sanctity. Casey and I have three boys. And uh, they're kind of crazy, rambunctious boys. And we love them very much. We also have two other babies that we have never met before. And those babies, we believe the Lord has them for us. We have, we've had two miscarriages, and we will get to see those children someday. And it's going to be amazing for us to see these children. And for whatever reason, the days that God had planned out for them were like conception and just a little bit longer, and then, boom, he took them straight to heaven. And I don't understand why that is. I will not understand on this side of heaven, but I know that God has them. He has them. It means every human life is sacred from the womb to the tomb. So dignity includes God's care for individuals, individual accountability to God, and the sanctity of every human life. Now, so that's what scripture teaches. Think about what that begins to impact or change about lots of issues. I thought of a few. Uh, issues around capital punishment, gender, ideo gender ideologies, orphan care, care for those with disabilities, racism, treatment of, of migrants, and more. It absolutely impacts every aspect of our Christian view, and it, it definitely impacts our view of abortion. So, I want to begin to talk about the personal piece of this. Um, I want to talk about the divide on abortion. So when you look at the data, Americans are split like 50-50 on whether abortion is morally wrong 
or morally acceptable. Literally, it's like half and half. If you were to go poll people around the nation right now, probably 50% would say yes and 50% would say no. It is right down the middle. I uh, just looked up uh, what, what, what are the trends of abortion. I, I found this information. If you go to that next slide, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but I'll just sort of explain it to you. Um, that top dark blue line it represents the number of abortions in the United States of, of America starting in 1973 when Roe versus Wade was uh, codified into, uh, I guess, the Supreme Court case was decided. So at that time, there was 744,000 abortions per year. We had a height in 1990 of 1 1.6 million, and it's actually been on the decline since that time, which I think is actually really wonderful right? That's, that's wonderful news that less and less moms are choosing to abort children since that time period. So there's, there's been a change that's happening there across our nation. However, at that last one, so you can see there's a, that lower line, there's a little bit of a break. And so they stopped including the data from California. So we, we think that probably that 930,000 is probably the most accurate number that we have of the number of abortions in our nation every year. And I just did some, you know, a quick Google search to find out, like, when is a city considered large? And apparently that number is 250,000 people. So whenever they reach 250,000 people, that's a large city. So that just simply means that three plus large cities worth of children are actually being aborted every year in the United States of America. And what I want to simply say is that's 930,000 too many. We're divided on if abortion is okay in some circumstances, if it should always be legal, or if it should always be illegal. There's division on the various stages, how many weeks, stages of pregnancy. And the two camps, and you know all the camps, right? The two camps are pro-life and pro-choice. So pro-life uh, started in the... I think it was in the 60s in California, a group of doctors and lawyers and others went to, at that time, Governor Ronald Reagan. They started a coalition for life, and they were urging him to, um, to not sign laws that were pro-abortion laws. And because of that group of people, this movement became known as the pro-life movement. In response to that, uh, the term pro-choice was born. Um, however, I think that uh, that word choice is a very crafty choice of words. Um, because in reality, it, it refers to abortion as the choice. And here's what I mean. In 2019, Planned Parenthood performed 133 abortions for every one adoption referral, meaning their business is not adoption referrals. It is not contraceptives. It is primarily abortion. And this term, it, it implies that if you are pro-life, if you believe that, that, that life is, has a dignity and it's, it's from God, it's not you know, our, our decision, it's God, then you, if you believe that, then you want to take choices away from women. But what I want to ask the question is, are there no other choices that we could make before we get to the point of abortion? Amen? There's a few. There's a few choices that lead to that point. I remember whenever Casey and I were telling our friends and family that we were pregnant with a third child, someone uh, said to me, you know what causes that, right? <laughs> Joking with me. All the rhetoric is around um, what do we do in cases of rape or incest? or life-threatening conditions. And these are terrible things, amen? Right, those are terrible things. And of course, if you have an ounce of compassion in you, your heart turns because you, you don't want people to endure that kind of a thing. And you understand the dilemma of rape or incest or a life-threatening condition. So I just looked up like statistically how many women are facing that. And what I found is that point 
3% of abortions are for life-threatening conditions. So that's less than one for every 100 pregnancies. And less than 1.5% are sought for rape or incest. And we know that there's a whole stigma about reporting that or not reporting that. So I, I don't know exactly what the numbers are. But from what we see from, from the self-reporting of mothers is that over 96% of these are elective. Over 96%. And so that's just important for us to remember when all the rhetoric is around that one single issue, we have to remember that is, that's just a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of what's actually happening when it comes to abortion. The slogans of reproductive rights, women's access to health care, and my body, my choice are a little bit um, crafty in, in my opinion. I mean, I understand where they're coming from to, to say my body, my choice. I mean, how many of you want the government telling you what to do with your body, right? Nobody. I don't want the government telling me like what, like, you know, did you take your vitamins today, Chris? No, I didn't. I don't, I don't want you involved in that, right? And if you, if you think that, you're a liberal, <laughs> right? Because that's concern for individual rights. Let's ask a different question. Do you want the government to pass laws concerning what other people can do to your body? Yes, we do. If you were to just walk up and shoot me right now, I think the law should probably uh, prosecute you. Amen? That's wrong. So we do want laws that protect individual people. But what Psalm 139 told us 2,500 years before 4D sonograms can show us is that there's another body involved. And to abort a child is to remove its right to reproductive health in the future. To abort a child is to deny their access to health care, and statistically 50% of them will be female. And to abort a child is to deny them their choice about their body. It's to take it away from them. So what I would simply say is that when um, someone says, my body, my choice, I would say, look, you have a body and you've made some choices, but now there's another body involved. And we do not want to tread upon their individual rights. To, I know that that is considered a liberal position to say my body, my choice, but what I would just say is that it's not liberal enough because it's not actually protecting the individual rights of that human being. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I believe this is the next civil rights uh, issue. Um, I, I understand the rage that people felt around the George Floyd um, killing, his death, but it bothers me that, you know, 900,000 people die every year and nobody wants to burn down a city for that. And those people had no criminal record. They weren't on drugs. They weren't belligerent in a public place. They, they literally have done nothing wrong and they're killed and nobody wants to burn down a city. Something's wrong there. And so my, my point in all of this is wherever you stand, wh whatever part of the aisle you, you're on, okay? And I know I, our church is diverse, and we're not all going to think the same about every single uh, candidate or issue, and I don't expect us to, and that's not even the point of this series. But I do believe that we should stand up for the rights of the unborn as people who believe in the word of God. Our Savior came as a child, that the father overshadowed Mary and he put life into her womb. And Jesus was, he was pre prenatal and prenatal and postnatal and all those things. Jesus, in his ministry, he brings a little small child into the middle of his disciples and said, Unless you become like one of these, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
We are pro-life and we are pro-child. So, um, what do we do about this? Well, um, I listened to the story of a lady by the name of April Hernandez Castillo. She is an actress. She was in the film Freedom Riders in 2007, has been in other films. Um, when she was in her late teens, in, uh, that would have been probably in the late 90s, she got involved with a, what she describes as a, a very athletic, handsome young man. She said, I was in love. I mean, just in love. However, this person turned out to be abusive. And what started as kind of you know, mental and then verbal, and then it became physical to the point of uh, she was actually, she would, you know, she, she remembers having blood stains on her shirt because of the level of beatings that he was giving to her. And uh, eventually, because of that, she decided to break off that relationship. As soon as she did, she went to the local, uh, I want to say it was like a, a Wendy's or someplace like that. She ordered a sandwich, and she goes, and I just love this sandwich. It's the most amazing thing. I loved it, and I ate it, and I started to feel nauseous, and I started to go walk back in and say, like, I need my money back because I got food poisoning or something. And then she realized, wait a minute, I think I'm pregnant. She's in New York City. She's pregnant. She doesn't know what to do. She experiences panic and fear and shame. She Googles, uh, or I, I, she said it was dial-up internet at that time, so she probably went on AOL Instant Messenger or something like that and began to search. If you remember the old days of the internet, all that crazy stuff, right? She looks, she tries to find some place. She learns about this place called Planned Parenthood. She gets in a cab and she goes there and she remembers this big ominous building, a very corporate looking building and people were protesting out front. The police officer saw her, probably read her expression and said, do you want me to escort you in? She said, yes, please. She goes in. The woman says, um, how are you going to pay for this? It's going to be $400. She said, my tears were dropping like bombs on the paperwork. They call her back. She walks in. She sees the machine. And in her mind, she had already decided, I have no other choice. I have no other choice. She wakes up from the anesthesia, and she literally said, I just felt so, so empty. And I said out loud, I'm a murderer. The nurse consoles her. She puts on her clothes and begins to walk out the door. The protesters are still there. And an elderly woman walks towards her with a pamphlet in her hand, begins to hand it to her, and goes, oh, you had one of those, didn't you? And then she says this, you're going to go to hell. And my question is, if you believe in the sanctity of life, is that what Jesus' people do? Here's what Jesus did. The scribes and the teachers and the Pharisees bring a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. He had gone to the temple early in the morning. He was teaching and preaching, and people were already coming, and they bring this woman, and I'm just going to guess that she probably just has some sort of maybe sheet or something thrown over her, and they stand her right in the middle of everybody, and they tell him, look, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses says that we are to stone such a person. By the way, the law of Moses says the man and the woman were supposed to be brought out and stoned, but there was no man to be found. Hello? So already he's like, something's up here. Jesus, here's what he does. He stoops in the dirt and begins to write with his finger. And they keep pressing him. What do you say? The law says this. And finally, he stands up and he says, let he who is without sin throw the first stone. 
And then he stoops back down and starts writing again. And I always want to know, what was he writing? Because one by one, they all walked away. And he stands back up and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one. And he says this, neither do I condemn you. Do you hear that? Do you hear the heart of God? Neither do I condemn you. He's caught between the law and mercy. What does he do? How does he respond? Go and from now on, do not sin anymore. What's so beautiful about Jesus is he doesn't say, you know what? Adultery's cool with me. It's fine. All that. He doesn't put a rainbow flag on his church. He just says, go and sin no more. He does not change the definition of sin, but he offers her mercy. And the question is, how can he be both merciful and just? How is that possible? And the only answer is this, is that he was going to be condemned in her place. He knew he was going to walk to that cross. And the same Pharisees and teachers of the law that had marched her out were going to march him out. They're going to hand him over to the Romans. And then the Romans were going to march him out to a hill. And he was going to die for our sins. He was going to absorb all of the things that we have done and thought and said upon himself so that he can be both just and merciful. So the question is, what do Jesus' people do with an issue like abortion? And here's what I just want to say. The first thing is this, stand. Stand. You need to take a biblical stand on this issue, period. I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. Whatever aisle you're on, you need to be speaking your voice about what matters to you. One of the ways that you do that is with your voting. If you have not voted yet, I encourage you to do that, okay? You may have other channels that you want to pursue where you can tell those people who are supposed to represent you, here's what matters to me. Stand. The second thing is this. Stop. Stop sexual sin in your own life. Young men, do not sleep with a woman that you're not married to. Okay? That will totally end the unexpected pregnancy problem. Hello? They can supply it all day long, but if demand goes down, it's not an issue anymore. If you, if you don't want to marry her, then you, don't, you have no business being with her. So I would say, man up, commit yourself, and then get married. We'll have a service. We'll, I don't know, we'll find a place to do it. I'll marry you guys, and then you can go have as many babies as you want to have, and praise the Lord. It is a gift from God. It is a good thing. Amen? It's good. It's like a, my friend used to call it like a fire in the fireplace. He said, look, if you start building a fire in the corner of your house, some things are going to burn down, okay? It's going to be bad. But if you put the fire in the fireplace, it warms the whole house and everybody's happy. You can hang your stockings up there at Christmas time. It's going to be a great time, all right? Take that, all right? Women, do not sleep with a man who's not married to you, period. If he does not want to marry you, he's not worthy of you. Hello? Don't do it. If you're looking at pornography, stop. You're training yourself to think in a certain way. Your brain is learning how to think in a certain way that's going to lead to problems in your life. So we have to stop. We have to stop. So stand, stop. The second thing is this, receive. Receive the mercy of Jesus. The one who looks at you in the middle of your sins and says, neither do I condemn you. I will put that on to myself for you because he loves you so much. Receive his grace. If that's been a part of your story, he does not condemn you. 
The last thing is this, stoop, stoop. See, when the church has a prophetic voice, we have to remember that the best prophets spoke with tears. They spoke from a place of love. They spoke from the heart of mercy. They, they spoke not only of judgment, but of compassion of God. And so there's a posture that we have to take that is the posture of Jesus. When we're faced in these moments, we have to lower ourselves. We have to refuse to condemn while we at the same time refuse to lower God's standard. I'll end with this. Um, April Hernandez Castillo, years later, found herself with a new boyfriend, and he was a good guy. Um, they started to have relationship issues. If you've ever had relationship issues, you know how hard that is. Keep your hands down so that your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend doesn't get mad. I know you've never had relationship, but some people out there in the world do have them, uh, we hear. And so this man says, you know what? I feel like I need to start going to church. I'm looking for God. And she says, well, when you find him, tell him hello for me. Because what she had done is when that woman said to her, you're going to hell, she took that into her being and she, she condemned herself and she said, I will never have children again. She, she said, I'm, I'm done with that. I accept that. I'm a murderer. I did that and that's what I'm worthy of. But he started going. And then he started inviting her to go. And she did not want to go. But she said, eventually I gave in, but I was going to go my way. So she put on bright red lipstick. She had on Versace sunglasses. She sat in the back row. We're talking a Latina from New York City, okay? She was on the back row, and she was like, sitting there like, mm-mm, no. <laughs> but that day, the pastor began to speak about forgiveness. And when he started talking about forgiveness and what Jesus has done, she said, my heart just started to pound. And she's like, there was a moment where I, like, I raised my hands and it's almost like I just wanted to rip open heaven at that moment. And she said, I just went and I knelt down and I felt something come over my body that was like pure love. And she heard a voice say, my daughter, I forgive you. I love you. But I need you to forgive yourself. Later that day, she uh, is processing this incredible experience that she had at church. She goes to her boyfriend's house and they're talking. And as they're talking, she said, I had an underwater moment. And it was almost like he was talking, but all of a sudden his voice got really like kind of blurry and unclear. And it's almost like you're underwater and you kind of hear uh, like, you know, like it's distant, it's muffled. And she goes, and then I just saw the most beautiful green. She described it as Bob Ross green. Right, that kind of a green, just beautiful. And then she sees daisies, and the daisies are almost like swaying as if the wind is whispering to them. And she said, all of a sudden, in the middle of this beautiful scene, a little girl walks towards me, and she has brown hair and brown eyes and a white dress. And she looks at her and says, Mommy, I forgive you. I love you but he needs you to let me go. I'm okay, she said. Her name was Daisy. And she said, I just know that I know that I know that God had to show me that because he wanted me to know the depth of his forgiveness for me and that I could let this sin go and absolutely receive his mercy. And so wherever you are today, I just want you to know that Jesus has opened a way for you. Maybe sexual sin is just destroying you right now. And I want you to know 
Jesus has opened a way for you. Maybe your story is marked with abortion. Maybe you've had an abortion. Maybe someone you love has had an abortion. You encourage them to do it. Maybe you paid for one and you're feeling a sense in you like you have to deal with something. I just want you to know that Jesus is here for you today. Or maybe you've just been, you've been uh, denying the reality of what God's word has said in your own life about this issue and you've kind of just gone with the, the stream of the world and Jesus is calling you back right now and he's saying, look, I forgive you. I'm here for you today. And so today, I just want to say that Jesus has opened the way for you. He's calling us to stand and to stop and to receive and to stoop. Well, thank you again for listening today. And if this was helpful to you, you can like, share, subscribe, or leave a kind review. And you can learn more about Renaissance Church at ren-church.org.